All right, off we go tonight. Welcome into Soccer Matters on ESPN 97.5 and as always presented by the Daspit Law Firm. Tonight, the call-in number is always 713-780-3776, 713-780-3776. On the heels of the Killer Bees, streaming at ESPN975.com. I heard uh, Jeremy talking about the Astros going down today uh, to the Atlanta Braves, uh, I believe in extra innings. All right, uh, defending champs are out. Real Madrid, uh, rope-a-doping Manchester City, 1-1 in regulation. Penalty kicks is how Real Madrid advances. Antonio Rudiger hitting the winning penalty after misses from Manchester City's Bernardo Silva and Mateo Kovacic. Um, What can we say about this game? Close to 70% of the possession for Manchester City today. They had nine shots on goal to three for Real Madrid. Um, I think, more importantly, some really clear-cut chances for Phil Foden and Kevin De Bruyne um, that were skied over the bar that don't count on the nine shots on goal. There were only three shots on goal for Real Madrid. Okay, I know Madristas aren't going to like this. This was anti-soccer today. I'm a huge Carlo Ancelotti fan, but aesthetically, just playing for the counterattack, you can call it smart, you can call it brilliant, you can call it whatever you want. Um for me, it was ugly, um, but they didn't want to open up against Manchester City, nor do many people. Uh, even Vinicius Jr., Vinny Jr. wasn't really dangerous on the counterattack. But they got their one goal, 33 shots to eight for you data heads out there. 33 shots to eight in favor of Manchester City. 18 corners to one. So... Data's telling you who dominated the game, who had the ball. Uh, Finally, they get a tying goal from De Bruyne, but then it goes through uh, extra time. Only two saves for Ederson, eight saves for Lunen, and it goes down to penalty kicks, which is like a flip of the coin. And in the end, uh, it was misses from Bernardo Silva and Kovacic, and then the game-winning penalty uh, was hit by Antonio Rudiger. So... Defending champs are out, Guillermo. They're out. And uh, we now know what the semifinals are going to look like because Bayern Munich won 1-0 over Arsenal. Our friend Andrew Carlson is probably now, uh, we might have to walk him off the ledge maybe, right? It's possible. Yeah, I feel sorry for, you know, any Arsenal fan out there after this weekend result and today. But they're not out of it. They're not out of it. Six rounds to go. In the Premier League, don't begin to think that's over yet. Um, People are going to say now, oh, okay, Man City's going to be able to dial in on the Premier League and winning the title and all that. Uh, Bayern Munich 1-0 over Arsenal. Joshua Kimmich, uh, here's his goal. I think we have it, don't we? Uh, 1-0 today, and Kimmich sealing the deal for Bayern Munich. So this ends up being 3-2 on aggregate over Arsenal. Kimmich in the 63rd. Here's how it sounded. Leroy Sané. Pushed away by David Raya. Danger is still there. This is Guerrero. And the free header! Smashed in by Kimmich. And Bayern Munich have the lead. Yeah, he he got a good run out of it. I mean, that was a very, very powerful header. Uh, Back to City and Real Madrid. Rodrigo in the 12th. Now, this was bizarre. Kyle Walker loses. I don't know what he was doing, but he's... Raising his hand for offside, he's waving his arms, and he and he totally loses Rodrigo, and Rodrigo scores. And and as everybody knows, you get the first, you know, Real Madrid gets the first. They're pretty good at the, you know, cutting the head of the snake off and then seeing games out, and it worked today. Here's what it sounded like, 12th minute, Rodrigo. Wonderfully controlled by Bellingham. Valverde, Vinicius Julia looked offside to me. Square to Rodrigo, terrific save, he scored! A goal inside 12 minutes for Real Madrid. Madrid had some traveling fans. By the way, this was at the Eddie had. Kevin De Bruyne, very motivated today. Uh, it was really hard for them to find moments where Real Madrid pulled out of their shape. It was very rare. I mean, basically this game was played in like one-sixth of the field. Uh, and here's De Bruyne finally gets the equalizer in the 76. It's a clear from Rudiger that goes right to him, and he just smashes it in, in the roof of the net. Oh, he's found a cross. Jump for De Bruyne! <laughs> Jeremy Doku has unlocked the game, and Kevin De Bruyne has pounced. And Manchester City are on terms with 15 minutes to go. 
And then it goes to penalties. Antonio Rudiger with the winning penalty in this one. Antonio Rudiger to send Real Madrid through. Revenge! The sweetest revenge for Real Madrid. Shredded in Manchester last year. Celebrating in Manchester tonight. Real Madrid are Champions League semi-finalists for the 12th time in 14 seasons. So here's what we got. We got PSG against Dortmund in one semifinal, Real Madrid and Bayern Munich in the other. Let's get your thoughts on the Champions League. 713-780-3776. 713-780-3776 is the number to call in here tonight. Uh, let's go to Gio. Gio, what's your thoughts on the Champions League. Hey, uh, how's it going, y'all? Uh, I'm a Barca fan through and through. Um, I got to give, you know, obviously Madrid the, the respect. I mean, they were able to hold off Manchester City. I mean, just penalty kicks are penalty kicks, and it is what it is. But um, my question is, who – I mean, Byron – Byron just, you know, they missed out on the Bundesliga. You have uh, Dortmund with a surprising win. And obviously PSG, who were able to figure it out, obviously after, you know, being a man up uh, the Barcelona game yesterday. So who who is the favorite? Like who, I'm not, impre- you know, I, I am impressed with, you know, Madrid's performances today, but to, to be dominated like that and take it all the way to penalties, I mean, it's just, you know, it, it was, you know, hey, you know, on, on their how on their, you know, but have, you but, know, Gio, that's the Real Madrid way, isn't it? It, it isn't always pretty. Yeah. Um, they know how to win titles. <laughs> I think they have to be the favorite in this one. Um, listen, don't sleep on Bayern Munich, despite the fact that Bayer Leverkusen won the Bundesliga because. Uh, they're tried and tested, and, and maybe they're motivated in a very differing way. I think Dortmund might be the dark horse. Uh, and, of course, PSG's got uh, boatloads of attacking talent. Uh, like you said, uh, with 10 men, uh, I felt that was over with 10 men after Araujo was sent off in that game. And, and, and then, obviously, uh, Xavi got sent off a little bit later. That ended up being... Uh, I mean, I, I was actually very disappointed with Barcelona not showing a little bit more backbone in that game, even with 10 men. Um, so uh, I think the uh, the favorite right now has to be Real Madrid. Gio, uh, thank you very much uh, for the phone call. Uh, 713-780-3776. By the way, we have uh, Soccer Matters Extra interviews tonight. Tremendous interview for those of you who are Barcelona fans and La Liga fans. Uh, you go to... Um, ESPN975.com and the podcast tonight. Uh, those interviews are going to be there. We have Jordi Sunier from TV3 in Barcelona. He's also talking about the fact that there's a real good chance, it seems now, that Rafa Marquez will become the next coach of Barcelona. There's a lot of really good stuff in about a 30-minute interview there. And then Austin FC goalkeeper Brad Stuver over there as well. So we're, you know, we're, we're hitting you with a lot of content here. And later on tonight, we'll have Eric Goodman of the Verde Report in the Austin Chronicle. Uh, let's take another Champions League phone call here. Let's go to Bill. Bill, what's on your mind tonight? Hey, Glenn. I, uh, you know, I just have a question for you. So isn't it like the main main thing to win? Because that's what I thought uh, Real Madrid t- did today. And uh, the second part, I know you kind of highlighted it, but I don't hear it from other things. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Man City created their own bed by making the mistake in the back. Kyle Walker claiming for that offside. I know you talked about it, but that was a huge thing, and that really changed the game. So. I agree. I agree 100%. It's, it seems like he just lost him. Look, I, I'm. it's all about winning. I get it. Uh, but when I don't have a dog in the fight, I like the aesthetics, and I generally pull for teams that play more of the attacking football. Um, this can be... This can be positioned any way you want. If you're a Real Madrid fan, you're probably saying, you know, Glenn's full of it. Who cares? We won. We're on to the semifinals. You did. But you were dominated. Um, and that's just the way they elect to play it. Uh, and by getting that first goal, I, I, I agree with you. I think the tactical edge is there. And away they go. And you know what? It's a very good chance they're going to lift the title because historically they just 
they find ways to win. It's it, it, it's crazy. But Kyle Walker looked like he, you know, he just had a moment of a lack of concentration. He lost Rodrigo, and it, it led to the goal. Anything else, Bill? We ended up dropping him. Oh, okay. But he did hear out everything he said. Okay. Uh, anybody else here? 713-780-3776. 713-780-3776. By the way, Dortmund got past Atletico Madrid. Um, so, big time. Um, let's go to uh, Marcel Sabitzer's uh, game winner. 74th minute. This would make it uh, 5-4 on aggregate. That was a crazy game uh, yesterday, Atletico Madrid. Here's Sabitzer for Dortmund to get them to the semifinals. Long. Looking good, Brad. Fulkrug in the mix again. Sabitzer. Oh, it's 4 2 Dortmund. And they're ahead of the tie. Two goals in two minutes. All right, uh, let's go to the phone lines again. 713 780 3776. I think it's Siler or is it Tyler? Uh, you're up. Hi. What's up? It's Tyler. Um, so first off, I want to say up the channels forever. Um, this is another case of Erling Holland not showing up in big games. He doesn't show up against the big six in the Premier League. Doesn't show up in the Champions League. He uh, likes to poach farmers. If uh, Man City has Cole Palmer, I bet they nick a goal and move on. What are your thoughts on that? So here's here's what I would say about Erling Holland. Uh, I think one of the big questions when he was coming over from the Bundesliga in Dortmund was he was in a league that was very transitional, and he was allowed to run. And we all know he, he, he's a massive man, but he can run. And he, and he had a lot of open field play. He had a lot of transitional play where he could get opened up and run. So the natural way to think about him coming to the Premier League in a team like Manchester City was, look, all of a sudden – you're going to be playing in these games like today where teams are sitting, you know, inside their – in and around their 18-yard box. And there's absolutely no space. And you're going to have your back to goal. And you're – that's not really your game. And, and the question was, could this improve under Pep Guardiola? And I think as of late, yeah, he's a ghost because it's not easy for him to play like this, uh, especially against – you know, a team that has a structure like Real Madrid, they're not giving you an inch of any space. I mean, you're going to score goals. If you do, it's, it's, it's going to be difficult. But I think tactically it's very difficult for him. Um, no question about it. So I appreciate that, Tyler. Yep, thank you. Have a good night, man. All right, you too. Let's hit uh, Jonathan up real quick here. He's got a question about the Houston Dynamo, and then we're going to hit a break here. Uh, Jonathan, what's on your mind yeah. tonight? Yeah, so uh, thanks for taking the call. Just wanted to say – it's been fun to watch the team in the back two thirds of the field with, you know, Mikael and, and uh, Bardo and all of our guys just playing their hearts out from the back, Clarkie and, and goal. And we're clearly owning possession. The passes are coming together, but it feels like we get to that final third and we, we don't have any confidence to shoot or we we're just passing it around. And I'm, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on, what opens up the game? What gets us more aggressive? What gets us more chances and looks on goal? All right, so let me answer your question with a question of my own to you. Does it look any different than last year? Uh, not much. I no. mean, I, as far as, like, shape and pace, I mean... No, I, I mean the final third. Ache, Ache, I, I mean the final third. We yeah. all know this is a very good defending no. team. We all know it's a good yeah. possession team. But the final third doesn't look any different. Now, you're putting your I hopes agree. in a lot of guys that don't have a history of scoring a lot of goals. You're playing right now with Bossy and Sebastian Kowalczyk, who, by the way, scored a fantastic goal, but there were only two shots right. on goal. He had both of them. These are slim margins. Right. You're playing with a bunch of guys in the front part of your team that don't historically have a history of scoring a lot of goals. So I, I think we have to temper, you know, hey, why aren't we scoring more goals? Chance creation. I mean, look, the Dynamo found a way to scrape through last year um, they did have Corey Baird, who had eight goals, but they're doing it now without a striker. Uh, I think the eggs are in the basket of Sebas Ferreira getting healthy and Hector Herrera coming back. And then with some of the rule changes in Major League Soccer, they may be able to add some attacking talent uh, in the summertime. But, yeah, I mean, look, the Dynamo are 4-2-1, third in the West without Hector Herrera and Ferreira. 
think you'd be pretty happy. 2-1-1 one, one, heading into the game against Austin FC this weekend. Austin FC is 2-3-3, three, and three, 11th. Um, so they went 2-1 over Minnesota United with only a total of seven shots, two shots on goal. But I'll tell you what, it was worth the wait with Kowalczyk's goal. And Sebastian Kowalczyk is going to be our guest in the next segment, uh, I do want to remind you, Copa America is coming up June 22nd, Mexico, Jamaica, June 24th, Colombia, Paraguay, July 4th, quarterfinal, likely could be Lionel Messi if Argentina wins their group. Then you also got Inter Miami over there, and they're taking on Tigris. This is Tigris country, uh, and that's going to be at Energy Stadium. And then prior to that, June 8th, I believe, it's Brazil and Mexico up in College Station. It's It's crazy. Get your tickets, lsse.net, lsse.net. Caller number three, I got a pair of tickets to Houston Dynamo and Austin FC this weekend right now. Coming up, interview with Sebastian Kowalczyk, who had the game-winning goal for the Dynamo against Minnesota United. To Soccer Matters on ESPN 97.5. And on ESPN 92.5. Brought to you by the Daspit Law Firm. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Glenn Davis. All right, welcome back, everybody. LamontBrands.com. That's where you get your Soccer Matters t-shirts and hats, all to benefit the 501c Charity Snowdrop Foundation. LamontBrands.com. We got orange dynamo colors there. We got uh, a new red one in. I'm hoping uh, some of the Liverpool supporters groups or uh, Arsenal pick those up, or maybe U of H Cougars. Soccer Matters t-shirts to benefit the 501c Charity. Also, Danish Inspirations, Modern Contemporary Furniture. Uh, my house is full of the products. I've got Stressless. Got the L-shaped couch, beautiful leather chairs for my marble kitchen island. DanishInspirations.com is the number. There's a lot of strange stuff that happens in the world of soccer. It's clear something strange is happening. So much so that Glenn ended up buying out a theater to showcase all of the weird stuff. It's time for Glenn's Theater of the Bazaar. All right, it doesn't uh, get much more bizarre than this. Al-Halal 4-1 to over al Idihad in a cup final in Saudi Arabia. Amdurazak Hamdala, who has represented Morocco, well, he, he scored in the loss, but also missed the penalty kick. He's walking down the tunnel. He tosses water at a fan. The fan then whips out a whip and starts to whip him. This is in a soccer stadium in Saudi Arabia and is hitting him. The player whipped by the fan during the confrontation after the Saudi Super Cup final. Um, and this Moroccan player, uh, first of all, I don't know how somebody gets a whip into the stadium. Second of all, uh, nobody's revealed who this guy is, uh, but that is as bizarre as it gets, and that is our theater of the bizarre. Yeah, that was weird. All right, this isn't weird. He's one of the best uh, when it comes to covering Austin FC. He is Eric Goodman. He joins us now. Uh, he has the Verde Report in the Austin Chronicle. Eric, how are you tonight? I'm good, Glenn. But, you know, weird is kind of what we do in Austin. So I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm, if I'm going to take that as a compliment if you intended it because uh, we, we try to keep it weird around here. I don't think you want it weird like that with people whipping out whips. Um, uh, that was just totally bizarre. I don't know if you saw that highlight or not, but it, it was just totally bizarre stuff. And, of course, the guy who did it hasn't been named. You wonder if he's a part of the club, actually. Yeah, it, you're right. Yeah, it's it's the kind of thing that um, no amount of, of of money that they want to spend on their league can get rid of. I mean, that's that's the cultural thing, which is why so many people um, will, will not watch games involving some of their favorite players that go over uh, to leagues like that because you just have you know stories like this that that hopefully over time you know yeah I, I saw the headline and I couldn't believe it, but also you know you hear about things that happen in stadiums like this, and, and nothing really is surprising anymore. Absolutely shocking. And by the way, Neymar was there, and so was Kareem Benzema. All right, Eric, let's get into Austin FC. Synopsis on a 2-3-3 three, and three season so far, 11th in the West. I know there's been a lot of pressure floating around Austin now. Give us your synopsis on where this team is right now coming into Houston on Saturday. Yeah, definitely in, in a state of flux because um, prior to their last match when they went on the road against St. Louis and just looked awful, looked like you know they were there to, to eke out a nil-nil draw at best, um, you know, barely, barely pressed forward at all with any ambition. Prior to that, though, two games at home, uh, you know, it was it was the best soccer they played uh, all season by a large stretch. 
Uh, they were dynamic. They were creative. Uh, they were turning possession into consistent opportunities, which has always been kind of the knock against Josh Wolf's teams is that, you know, he might say, he might, he might like to talk about how that's their goal, but it rarely has played out that way on the pitch. Um, getting Sebastian Drewski back to full health has, has been huge, but this, this team has just been so bad, so bad on the road that I think um, this match against Houston, which is a team they've had a lot of success against. I think they've played eight times since Austin joined MLS. Austin's won five of them. Uh, so this is, this is a pretty interesting test to see uh, if Austin can finally go on the road uh, and get a point or get a win. Eric Goodman, Verde Report, Austin Chronicle. Uh, highly suggest you you get into his reading. Uh, I, I love the way he covers Austin FC, and he and he does it with a bit of an edge. He's not afraid to be uh, in a very healthy and fair way critical, which I think we need more of that type of commentary and reporting in Major League Soccer. All right, Sebastian Driussi, two years ago, guy was off the charts and off the chains. Unbelievable season. Clearly, to me, could have been the MVP. Um, former River Plate, 28 years of age. You said he's getting back into the swing of things. Is it really all dependent on how he goes, Austin FC goes? I mean, it, it shouldn't be. That's not how you develop a consistent, uh, you know, thriving attack. But, but it just has been that. You know, in, in every period where Austin FC has had success, for you, he's been at the center of it. Um, obviously, it was, it was scoring goals. Uh, in 2022, which he did, like I think, I think he led the league that year in not, in like difference between goals scored and expected goals, which is to say, like he's scoring goals that you wouldn't expect any player to score from. And so, um, he's still very impactful. Since then, he's been very impactful just in build up, and, and he's still, you know, I love watching him just with the ball at his feet, dribble. He'll, he'll play passes that are really only kind of the the elite players and the elite creative minds in the game can see and then can execute. But he hasn't been the goal scorer that he was in 2022, and and that's really where Austin struggled. Uh, and, and they're also they're just you know an older team for for such a young franchise that hasn't been in the league very long. Uh, their roster and, and their players that are you know most most commonly in the starting eleven. It, it's a pretty old team, a pretty slow team. So they've been caught out on the break a lot this year, and uh, you know there's not much Sebastian Bruce can do about that. Talking to Eric Goodman. Um, all right, so Ethan Finley, Jassy Zardes, they're in the twilight of their careers. Uh, they've had great careers. Emiliano Rigoni hasn't really worked out. Um, I guess we can take a look at Diego Rubio and Obreon. Have, have they been a good complement to him? Or are they potentially the, the new complements to him, uh, both acquired in the offseason? Yeah, I think both have, have brought exactly what Austin needed in, in different ways. Rubio's brought the kind of just like personality first and foremost. And Rubio's got such an edge to him. He's such a competitor. Uh, it's the kind of thing that Austin would seem to me we just didn't have, especially last year. Two years ago, they had center back Ruben Gabrielson, who was kind of that firebrand, that rah-rah leader uh, that you know I, they sorely missed last year. And Rubio gives them a little bit of that edge. And he also has been dangerous, and he's just a kind of an irritant against you know opposing center backs. He just kind of grinds and grinds, and sometimes will get on the end of a chance. And then Obreon, you know, we talk about how slow Austin to see has been. Uh, he he does bring some speed and some dynamism, some verticality, uh, and, and a lot of what they've they've done. It like I said, those last two home games uh, where they scored six matches, they, their first two wins, or uh, he was kind of at the center of, of creating that. Uh, so, and also you mentioned Rigoni. I don't know if it's a coincidence that in those two games where they looked their best, Rigoni lost zero minutes across despite being completely healthy. Yeah. Talking to uh, Eric Goodman, Obreon Dy Dynamo fans are going to know him from his time at FC Dallas. You know, Diego Rubio is one of these guys that you go, man, you know, he's obviously got talent, uh, Chilean, and, you know, he kind of, bounces around a few teams and you just think that a coach is thinking, okay, it's going to be me. That's going to unlock his potential. Um, how much of him really producing is, is going to play a part in this team being more dangerous. I mean, Austin, it's funny because Josh Wolf, you know, was a, was a striker in, in, in his playing career. And yet since he's been the head coach of Austin, I see the striker positions just never really been, uh, a productive spot for this club. And I don't know if that's by design. I mean, obviously so much happens from Jerusi. Uh I, I know it, in a lot of the way, Joshua, his teams like to play is to, is to push the ball out wide, get crosses in, 
you know, Diego Rubio, I stood next to him. He, he's not that tall. I don't, know, I don't know exactly what he's listed at, but I mean, he's not a, a tall target forward. Uh, maybe they expected Giazzi's artist to be more along those lines, but that's also never really been his game. He, he's more of just kind of a, a, a poacher in the six-yard box. So it, it, it does seem like an awkward fit. Um, but again, he does make up for that in just constant effort, constant just irritation of, of the back line. And, and he has been able to start getting on the end of, uh, of some chances and, and give off some goals. See how that's going to work out with Diego Rubio and uh, has had real flashes and glimpses of, of, of pretty remarkable talent at times. Um, matchups, uh, transition you mentioned before. The Dynamo will look to get that verticality and transition through uh, Aliu Ibrahim, who's the leading scorer with three, and, of course, Obreon. How has Austin FC dealt in transitional moments this year so far over the course of, you know, the first uh, eight games? Yeah, it's been a huge talking point in Austin because it's been, it's been you know, pretty abysmal, and they know it, and they can't seem to do much about it. I mean, I, they, I, Austin FC score, uh, conceded 10 goals in open play this season. Six of them have come – as, as I looked back, you know, in, in what I would consider transitional moments where you're kind of scrambling, uh, you know, and, and they just, it's, I think it starts in the midfield because you've got uh, Josh Wolf has been playing a, kind of this three man midfield with obviously Drew Ucy, who's not even much of a midfielder. He does, you know, he, he plays kind of that number 10 attacking midfield. And then you have Alex Ring and Danny Ferreira who both like to get forward and neither are great ball winners. So, I think that's where, if, if I'm Josh Wolf, I'm looking at somebody like Johan Valencia, who, you know, made it made his name in Colombia as just a, somebody who chases down it and, and exact, is a stopper and does exactly what what they've missed. And, and also in the back line uh, in transition, just Julio Cascante and some of these defenders have a tendency to lose their man, to lose their mark on, uh, you know, in the in these breakaways. And you just end up with a lot of Austin FC players throwing their hands up as a, you know, a cross goes in and an unmarked guy finishes it. So that's really what they've tried to clean up, but it hasn't shown. Uh, they haven't really made much progress, and that's how they conceded their, their lone goal against St. Louis, which led to uh, a 1-0 loss last week. By the way, Julio Cascante picked up a yellow in that game. He's not available. Can the Dynamo midfield overrun them with, with the likes of Artur and Coco Carrasquilla? Is it just too much power and strength? I, I, I don't know if that's how I would play it if I was Houston. I would let Austin have as much of the ball as they want. And, and then, like you said, you know, play, play on, on the break. You know, Austin, especially on the road, even though when they've had possession, they haven't really looked to do too much with it. I mean, that's really been their, their way of defending, in a sense, is just holding the ball, being very conservative with it. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm Ben Olsen, I'm letting Austin see have as much of the ball as they want. Houston's been tremendous defensively this year. Uh, they do have the pace. Uh, to, to counter and and I, I really think you're not uh, risking too much by letting Austin have you know a, as much of the ball as they want. So. Yeah, and the Dynamo at home they tend to be very aggressive. Um, they will settle into a mid block and at times deeper and and certainly can have transitional moments. Um, but I'm interested to see how how much Austin really comes out in this game uh, on the road because they certainly didn't come out and and, and really. I don't think the chance creation wasn't there. I think Josh Wolf was saying the execution lacked and they might have been one pass away from it. They, they got into decent positions, I guess he said in the box. Right? They're, they're always one pass away. You know, <laughs> it, there's, it's always one pass away. Eric, you are uh, one of the best. We appreciate you coming on tonight. Are you coming down to Houston for this game? Uh, I, I don't believe I'm going to be able to, you know, it's, it's, uh, but purse strings are tight around here. Uh, so I might just have to watch this one uh, from the road, but definitely looking forward to it. And, and these Copa Tejas matches, you know, I have, have been, it's a nice little break in the uh, just monotony of, of regular MLS, uh, MLS matchups. For sure. Eric, thank you so much for coming on. We look forward to having you on again. Great stuff. All right. Anytime, Glenn. Talk to you later. All Talk right. You Eric soon. Goodman, uh, Austin Chronicle, Verde Report. He really does a, great comprehensive job and and you know he's not tied to the club so he he uh, whips in his uh, opinion and there is a little bit more pressure on up there you know glenn does have other opinions outside of the matters of soccer wait really yes he does time now for glenn's non-soccer take all right, uh, we're talking commercialization of sports. The Wall Street Journal recently had an article by Jason Gay, and it was quoted, is golf scaring off its fans? And I, and I read this with interest because, listen, we all know sports 
is getting so commercialized right now. We sometimes wonder if it's really about the sport or what the sport can do for others. Golfers are worried, though, professional golfers, that they are losing fans due to the fight. And the author, Jason Gay, called it a civil war between the PGA Tour and the Saudi-funded Live Golf. He highlights separate tours, different people in in roles of responsibility and bosses, fields, styles of competition, world ranking issues now, and the fight over power and money between what he calls the jet set clubhouse class. So apparently now, golfers are concerned that the loyal, authentic golf fan is being pushed away. And of course, they aren't pushed away from the Masters. Everybody tuned into that, but maybe some of the other PGA events. So golfers are concerned. It's going to do it for that segment. And, uh, yeah, I have an opinion once in a while on other things. All right, I think that's going to do it uh, here tonight. But before, before we go, uh, by the way, Caitlin Clark, four-year contract. She'll get 338056 So she's basically making first year $76,000, 2nd dollars Yes, I know, you're out there going, oh, my God, but she's making so much money in sponsorships. Yes. But one of the beauties of her coming to this league is hopefully that she's going to raise the salaries. And the salaries uh, seem higher in the NWSL. All right, uh, Guillermo Lazo Romero, another good job here tonight. Uh, we got a lot of content coming out. Don't forget the Brad Stuver interview is up right now on ESPN975.com. It's up. You want to hear Brad Stuver, goalkeeper for Austin FC, Jordi Sunier, TV3 Barcelona on everything Barcelona. Will Rafa Marquez become the next coach? We don't know. We thank uh, everybody for tuning in tonight. Check out the podcast. Hit us up on uh, YouTube, Soccer Matters. We will have a pregame show on Saturday as I'll be doing the call on uh, Apple TV for the Dynamo Austin FC. Thanks for tuning in tonight. And remember, next Monday night, 6 o'clock Central, Wednesday, 6 o'clock Central. Remember, Soccer Matters.